Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this introduction. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with you. Um, good morning and perhaps good afternoon to all of you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank IFFD for organizing this workshop and for all its work on family well-being around the world. I also appreciate the long-term collaboration we had on family-oriented research and policy development. Um, our work at the UN focuses on exploring megatrends, as you know, and their impacts on families. And uh, we try to offer recommendations on family-oriented policies to tackle their negative impacts and harness their positive effects. So the megatrends of new technologies, urbanization, migration, demographic change have been um, guiding our preparations. And of course, climate change is also a very important trend that we are still yet about to be explored. Um, however, we already started exploring the interlinkages between all the um, mega trends. So um, we can try, we can, um, sorry about that. Um, so to be sure, all mega trends are interrelated. Demographic trends impact all other trends. Sorry, Renata, we cannot hear you well. I don't know if your microphone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I was trying to reduce the noise of the computer emails, but. That, that's better there. Okay, okay. Okay. To be sure, um, uh, demographic trends impact all, on all other trends. Increasing human activities linked to climate change. Same goes for migration and displacement. As we have growing evidence that migration is becoming more and more climate induced. So, for instance, according to the International Organization for Migration, there are an estimated 281 million international migrants and around 740. 140 million internal migrants. In 2020 alone, 40, 40 million internal displacements were new ones. And of those displacements, 30 million, over 30 million, which is 76%, were triggered by weather related disasters. So this indeed is a very worrying trend. So it's very timely to talk about climate change. The summer has been extremely hard in Europe. We have been, we have in the US and other parts of the world. We had droughts, we had floods. And actually quite recently, um, the spokesperson of, for the UN, just a few days ago, uh, talking about the floods in Pakistan, noted that the areas most impacted by this unprecedented clim climate catastrophe are, are um, extremely large. One third of the country has been underwater. Uh, the flood killed um, over 1,000 people, impacted 33 million. So it is really timely, very timely to talk about um, climate change. And I think the trends are really um, accelerating. And it's not only the large scale events like storms, tsunamis, floods. There are also slower onset changes in climate change, like droughts which actually increase the likelihood of migration much more than natural disasters. So it is families that depend on the land that, and try to adapt and stay in place as long as possible. And as a result, remain in high risk areas, becoming vulnerable when disaster strikes. Here, climate change disproportionately affects rural and indigenous families. Um, in a recent report, scientists said that the chances of climate catastrophe are ignored and not enough preparations are being made to face their consequences. And um, some of the worst possible climate change catastrophic scenarios are not under scrutiny. Such scenarios may include collapse of society and the potential even extinction of humans. Um, some of the sci scientists around the world uh, have been calling on the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the world's um, authoritative climate change organi science organization, to add a special science report on catastrophic climate change to bring into focus how much is at stake in a worst case scenario. So, um, in their perspective, um, they, they raise the issues that are quite that are av avoided by scientific and uh, community and policymakers so so um basically um 
good risk analysis con consider both what's most likely and what's the worst that could happen. Uh, but because of pushback from <clears throat> non-scientists who reject climate change, mainstream climate science has concentrated on looking on at what's most likely and also disproportionately on low temperature warming scenarios that come close to international goals. However, there is not enough emphasis on how things, the risks, the big risks could go possibly very wrong. So when global science organizations look at climate change, they tend to just look at what happens in the world with extreme weather, high temperatures, melting ice sheets, rising seas, and plant and animal extinction. But they aren't factoring enough how these reverberate in human societies and interact with existing problems like war, hunger, and disease. So if we don't look at this intersecting risk, we may be painfully surprised. Um, and as you could see with COVID-19, well, yeah, I think it's a good example um, where it was um, a, thing, a mistake health professionals made before COVID-19 when assessing possible pandemics. They talked about disease spread, right? But they, uh, no one really was prepared about uh, for lockdowns, supply chain, supply chain problems, and spiraling economies or increase in crime and violence as well. So these scenarios were have not been. Um, um, thought about, and we and the societies were were not prepared to tackle this this additional problems that COVID nineteen brought about. So, um, moving on to um, some uh, recent initiatives of the United Nations, I would like to uh, speak a little bit about uh, what UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez said uh, recently. Um, last month, actually, um, about climate change and um, giving some warnings and giving some recommendations. So he, uh, the Secretary General, recently noted that household budgets everywhere are feeling the pinch from high food, transport, and energy prices fueled by climate breakdown and war. And this threatens a starvation crisis for the poorest household and severe cutbacks for those on average incomes. Um, and we are already seeing the warning signs of a wave of economic, social, and political upheaval that could have leave no country untouched. So the Secretary General has established the Global Crisis Response Group to find coordinated global solutions to this triple crisis, recognizing these three elements, food, energy, and finance that are deeply interconnected and, of course, relate to climate change. So let me, let me mention some of the recommendations relating to climate change um, that Secretary General mentioned. Um, so first, um, it is immoral for oil and gas companies to be making record profits from this energy crisis on the backs of the poorest people and communities and at a massive cost to the climate. The Secretary General urges all governments to tax these excessive profits and use the funds to support the most vulnerable people through these difficult times. Second, all countries and especially developing countries must manage energy demand. Conserving energy, promoting public transport, nature-based solutions are essential components of that. Third, we need to accelerate the transition to renewables, which in most cases are cheaper than fossil fuels. Storage technologies, including batteries, should become public goods. Governments must scale up and diversify supply chains for raw materials and re renewable energy technologies. Governments must also support the people, communities, and sectors most affected with social protection schemes and alternative jobs and livelihoods. And fourth, private and multilateral finance for the green ener energy transition must be scaled up. I believe that these recommendations have to be taken on board by governments, private sector, civil society, and families around the world if we are to avert severe climate change consequences. Thank you for raising awareness of climate change, its impact on families, and finding solutions for sustainability. Thank you very much for your attention. Can you hear me well? Yes, we do. Okay, Go great. Um, I was wondering, um, since we're making an advocacy plan today, um, and the advocacy plan, the goal of it is to be as inclusive as possible so that it can be applied all across the world. Um, but the problem with that is that it becomes so abstract that sometimes I have the idea or I have the question, 
what the direct effect of such big uh, projects actually is. Could you tell me something about that since you work in the United Nations, with it, which is a very um, high-positioned uh, organization in the hierarchy? Yes, definitely. So as you know, United Nations is an intergovernmental organization. So our, our goal is really to give recommendations. First of all, raise awareness of the issues that are important that face us all. Um, and then focus on specific issues that are most important and then mobilize the governments to do something about it. So, you know, so the intergovernmental um, the panel on climate change, for example, has been talking for years and years about the risks of climate change, right? We have, they have been recommendations for, for years about that. And, but it's really up to the governments to, to listen to those recommendations and implement them. So basically, I mean, of course, you have those big summits, right? You have the big summits uh, that come up uh, <laughs> with recommendations or guidelines or plans of actions. and But it's really up to the governments, right, to implement them. So now we, we, we paint the big picture. We paint the big picture. We, we um, give, the, give the recommendations. We also give some good practices. There's a lot of good practices that are shared on the UN website. So we give examples of what, could, what can be done. But ultimately, it's really up to governments, right? So, but governments are elected, right? So um, it's really up to the people to, set, to elect the, the, the governments they want to have, right? So, so parties that support, you know, climate change um, efforts, you know, green parties, you know, um, it, you, you know, it's up to the electorate to to choose those uh, those um, you know parties to to be represented and to fight for climate change. There are also many movements that people can join for for um, environmental justice, for example, um, to to involve more women uh, in in decision decision making. For example, you know, the the it's mostly women who are actually rural. Uh, workers who really see the effects of, of climate change, you know, uh, for their land. Um, so we need really participatory approach where all all people are involved, um, and really it's people who have to demand action uh, uh, on the part of governments. And I think civil society has an important role in this because it can unite people together on specific cause, raise awareness, and then um, you know do advocacy you know, within communities, within local government, and then take it higher to a national level. So, um, so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all related. <laughs> Ultimately, you know, we, we work from the top level, but it's really up to you to help. And, uh, and like, hopefully this workshop as well is important for advocacy uh, efforts and uh, you can take it to your local governments uh, uh, with the results, you know, with the um, uh, whatever recommendations you adopt. So um, hope, I hope I answered your question. I'm a, a student here in the Netherlands. I study uh, European law and I'm the coordinator of the advocacy plan today. So it's especially uh, relevant for me to have some goal in mind when drafting the document. So thank you very much for the answer. Thanks. Uh, my name is Viktor Molnar. I'm a volunteer in at Noe from Hungary, and I would like to ask you if you have any good example of uh, second or third world countries where they rely on non-green solutions for their uh, economy. So, for example, factories, uh, oil production, or gas um, usage. So that's what the main. Uh, economy is all about. Is there any good example where the government realized that this is uh, really bad for the uh, climate change and try to actually go for a greener path that we could use for this advocacy plan as an example? Okay. Um, in, in, in case of developing countries, I know that there are quite uh, good policies in China, well, which, you know, this is probably the the uh, the benefit of having a centralized government that can actually impose laws that uh, help the environment so and also give subsidies to companies that are green i um i i am uh, familiar with the what's happening in the us with the bills for green energy 
companies. So that was recently introduced um, to the Congress and was adopted as a bipartisan initiative. And this bill also supports uh, green um, green companies. So I think like the, the combination of tax incentives, right, for the companies that um, develop new technologies is very important. And, um, and it really leads from government, you know, that leads to um, innovation uh, from the private sector. And um, for example, the, the companies that um, support storage, as the Secretary General mentioned, uh, the storage solutions for energy, this is really important, you know, the, the batteries, right, development of batteries, um, the hydrogen fuel uh, technology. This is such an, uh, this is a, a, by the way, this is an invention that has been in existence for a long time. So we could have clean energy source just by using hydrogen. Now, the implementation of that takes a long time because, you know, in the meantime, you have all these interests supporting oil and gas, right? So the money goes there. But if we really put, if the government supported development of this technology, we could, you know, it we could already have, if that happened, let's say 20, 30 years ago, the support, we already could have, you know, more green energy sources from the government. So, um, so, there, are, so there are examples, I would say, kind of small scale, small scale um, examples around the world. But I really think what's most important is legislation supporting the green energy, because that's the beginning that's um, of having sustainable uh, energy solutions. Um, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. My name is Victoria Favila. I'm a marketer here in Universidad Panamericana, and I'm also a social entrepreneurship. Thanks for the, the, the talk. I have a question for you, and it's, would there be any way to use these new technologies that are currently being implemented, such as NFTs, or blockchain technology to help to reduce the energy used by the same technologies or help another industry to reduce the energy consumption? Okay, thank you. Well, this is a very technical question. To be honest, I, I don't know. I only know that it's really the, uh, the, the blockchain, you know, and uh, all this mining um, takes a lot of energy. Uh, and um, of course, you know, electricity, um, electricity, you know, has to be produced, right? And not necessarily does it, it comes from green sources. So um, uh, energy consumption with the, with the block, blockchain technologies is, is, uh, is problematic, in my opinion, you know, it is. So unless we find, you know, we, we have um, green sources for, the, for electricity supply in general, right? Uh, then we can address, you know, the, the blockchain energy consumption in a more sustainable ways. Um, yeah, you know, as an example, you know, in New York, we have um, we have an option to have all the energy uh, supplied from renewable sources, right? So it's really up to the consumer. So maybe I feel less, uh, you know, uh, guilty when I use uh, electricity. Uh, try not to overuse. <laughs> but because it comes from green sources. So I think like um, probably in your countries, you have these options as well. So in this way, we can support the green energy providers. You know, just look at your electricity bill and see where it comes from, where the energy comes from. If you can switch to green sources, then do it. Even if it's a slightly li uh, uh, higher cost, I think you you know you feel better. <laughs> you know that your electricity comes from green sources. Um, so that's maybe halfway satisfying answer. Um, but uh, I hope you know you look at your electricity bills <laughs> more carefully. I know that this is a very important problem to address, uh, and children may uh, pay for for it in the future. There are two different kinds of uh, actions that we should take, like the macro actions, as you said, uh, in the laws, to change everything in the laws, uh, and also the, the micro ones, the, the ones that we do within our families. I don't know if you could just uh, tell us like some tips we could do within our families in order for these to be uh, real in our, in our, yeah, in our context. 
Yes. So it's a, if I understand correctly, how to help with the uh, with um, uh, conservation efforts, uh, recycling, all that, right? In within families. Yes. So so this is really important. Um, I think first of all, in the family, I mean, we are the educators, right? The families are the educators of the next generation. So basically, um, you know, just educating children about um, you know all the possibilities for. Uh, recycling for conserving resources like water electricity um this is the first step then i think w volunteering in the in the community for green projects is very important some some schools have this um uh, in the us it's called community service uh where you can you can help you you know you can choose a project that's environment sustainable project right so that's already cooperation between schools and parents so schools demand that but the parent can can help to choose the project the children can be involved with that they can learn more about sustainability help um you know in a park for example you know uh, in in dark in gardens um or help with um water water conservation projects so um so that that family can encourage and of course like um you can you can make small steps that that produce big results for example um we we stopped buying plastic bottles years years ago like i think this is something that it's really <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's a problem that triggers me personally when i see people um drinking from plastic bottles uh the the bot the the water in in it's not better it, usually it's from municipal sources um and it's the same as as tap water right so plus if you have you have pl uh, particles if you get plastic bottles you get particles of plastic in the water so it's really unhealthy to consume this kind of water so there are purification systems you know you can install in your faucet you know uh, or sometimes it's not even needed it's a good quality water and drink that water um don't buy plastic waters this is uh, plastic bottles this is a huge problem really it, it's it pollutes the oceans pollutes the and they are and most the uh, most of the these plastic waters the, um are, are not re not being recycled so don't kid yourself that if you put the plastic bottle in the re uh, receptacle it says you know for recycling don't kid yourself that it will be recycled so um this is really one small step but think about it like if if we were not buying all this plastic how how much less pollution we would have um so uh steps like that i think like um really um any family can do you know again look at your electricity bill see where the power comes from um even you know recycling clothes like i know in large families a lot of recycling goes on the children reuse the the clothes you know this is also a one industry that uses a lot of um, re resources to you know to produce clothes so again this is another area families can be aware of um yeah, so these are some of the practical solutions families can take on board.